evening, everybody, and welcome to Christline. My name is Tyler, and joining me tonight, two very special gentlemen, Brother David and Brother Manuel. Praise the Lord, everybody. In tonight's discussion, we're going to be discussing and talking about the early church and the history of the church. I do believe that this is going to be a very interesting topic for each and every one of you. As we dive into the Word of God, let's turn our Bibles to the book of John, chapter 3, and we will be beginning to read, <clears throat> starting in verse number 1. And we're going to read uh, verse 1 and 2. So I'm going to read the scripture, and I'll have Brother David read the notes. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Said to have been one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. A ruler of the Jews. A member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. The same came to Jesus by night. It is not known exactly as to why he came by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. The pronoun we could indicate that Nicodemus represented several members of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus addresses Christ here as a man and not as God. The cross would change him. For no man can do these miracles that you do, except God be with him. Amen. In this he is correct. So we see that um, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He is one of the uh, highest members of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Whenever Jesus had started his earthly ministry, you know, he, he spoke very vibrantly and taught a lot of things about the Word of God that so many people, you know, all they knew was the law of Moses at that time. And, you know, it, it amazed everybody. The people marveled at his teachings and at his doctrine. And so much that Nicodemus was very curious and went to ask him. You know, he met up with him at night as not to draw attention or a, a crowd. And he, he went to Jesus at nighttime and he asked him, you know, um, you know how, um, how can a man enter the uh, kingdom of God? And Jesus told him that you must be born again. But however, Nicodemus saw and realized that no man can do these miracles that you do except that God be with him. Amen. And that was the thing about Christ was that <laughs> God was with Jesus. Even though Jesus was fully man, still he was fully God. And I want to turn our attention, um, let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter 24. All the time throughout Jesus' ministry, we see that he called 12 disciples to follow him and to learn of him. Yes, yes. And he taught them the word. He taught, he taught them um, his commandments. And he taught them how to love and of the sort. And all that time after they had been with him and have been taught by him, he always, there was, I, I believe there was three or four times that Jesus foretold his death, burial, and resurrection. And he told him that the Son of Man must be given up and he was given for, um, to be given as a ransom for sins. And that he would go to the cross and he would atone for all sin, past, present, and future. And he, and, said, he said it on many occasions. Yes. And it just there, there was, uh, and, and not just to the disciples, but many others that he was trying to tell, not you know straight out, but he was telling them in ways that they they you know couldn't understand. He was trying to, you know, like the temple, for example. They, yeah, for the exactly destroy this temple, yeah, and in three days I will make it right. There you go. Yes. So. Yes, that's correct. And the disciples didn't understand what he was talking about, you know, and some of them didn't believe that that would actually happen. But it wasn't until Jesus ascended to the Father and afterwards that they finally understood what he meant and what he was talking about. Amen. So let's read in the book of Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start reading in verse uh, 46. So, again, I'm going to read the scripture, and I would like Brother David to read the notes. 
And he and said unto them, Thus it is written. Proves what I have just stated concerning Christ and the cross. And thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Let us say it again. This is the story <clears throat> of the Bible. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Represents God's method of proclaiming his word and carrying out his work. Any other method is unscriptural. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. God's plan of salvation is identical for all regarding race, color, or culture. It is for the whole world. And you are witnesses of these things. Christianity was not begun as the result of an enlightened philosophy, as with all religions. It was begun by men and women who literally witnessed the incarnate Son of God in all his earthly ministry, as well as his death and resurrection. Consequently, they could say, We have seen and do testify. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. The baptism with the Holy Ghost, which would come on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. This is where, this was where the temple was located and where the day of Pentecost was always celebrated, which would, which would occasion the outpouring of the Spirit. This was only for the initial outpouring since then, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit wherever the person might be. Acts chapters 8 through 10, 8, 10, and 19. Until you be endued with power from on high. This is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, which is always accompanied by the speaking with other tongues. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Without being thus endued, the believer and the church are of little worth to the kingdom of God. So I would like to back up and go back to the beginning of the reason why Jesus had to come into this world. is because that he had to reconcile man back to himself by atoning for sin. And I mean all sin, past, present, and future. Because when God created man, man fell. And since then, sin, sin has entered the world. And man is a sinner and in dire need of a savior. So God would send his only son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin, come into this world and fulfill the law and satisfy the demands of a thrice holy God and die on the cross to atone for all sin. And while he was here on earth, again, he recruited the Holy Spirit, led him who to call. And it was 12 disciples. And he taught them everything that they need to know as long as he was here and there was many times as brother Manuel was stating that there were um, a lot of times where he foretold about his death burial and resurrection and he as brother David gave the scripture you can tear the body down and I'll rebuild it again in three days and then he had told them that I'm not going to always be here with you because I shall send you another comforter and he shall be with you and in you he was going to send the holy spirit into the world because he was going to go up to his father if he was not going to send the holy spirit he would still be here but he was going to because he was ascending to his father to see, sit down on the right hand and it, it's incredible how we have a part to play in the kingdom of god I'm so glad that he loves us so much and cares about us so much that he wants to use us for his purpose. Each one of us have a particular purpose. We were created with a special and unique purpose. We have a unique calling in our lives, and we are to seek God as far as his will for our lives. And so with that being said, he told them not just to go out there and to start doing the work of God, but he told them to tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father because he was going to send the Holy Spirit. And as we were reading in the book of John, chapter 3, as scripture says, no man can do these things, can do these miracles except that God be with him. Right. And the reason why the disciples were able to do uh, some of those things, they were not just 12, but there is, there is a chapter or a couple, I think it was, 
at least one chapter in the four gospels where he actually sends out 70 and he gave them power to cast out devils in his name to recover in the sight lay, lay hands on the blinded eyes that they would be opened up and see and raise the dead and etc and they all return because all those things were actually done but it was through the name of Jesus and it was because he had given them power and the scripture says right there in the book of Luke chapter 24 verse 49 he said tarry in Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the father to be endued with power from on high and in the book of Acts as we read in uh, chapter 1 let's start it uh, let's start reading in verse 4 and being assembled together with them speaks of the time he ascended back to the father this was probably the time of the above 500 commanded them not a suggestion that they should not depart from Jerusalem the site of the temple where the Holy Spirit would descend but wait for the promise of the father spoke of the Holy Spirit which had been promised by the father in Luke chapter 24 verse 49 Joel chapter 2 which said he you have heard of me you have also heard me say these things for John truly baptized with water merely symbolized the very best baptism believers could receive before the day of Pentecost but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence spoke of the coming day of Pentecost although Jesus did not use that term at that time when they therefore were come together they asked of him saying seemingly presents the last meeting before the ascension Lord will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel he would later answer this question through the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. The Master is saying that it is not the business of the followers of Christ to know this information, but rather to occupy till I come. Luke chapter 19 verse 13. But you shall receive power. Miracle working power. After that, the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Specifically states that this power is inherent in the Holy Spirit and solely in his domain. And you shall be witnesses. Doesn't mean witnessing to souls, but rather to one giving one's all in every capacity for Christ, even to the laying down of one's life. Unto me. Without the baptism with the Holy Spirit, one cannot really know Jesus as one should both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth proclaims the work of God as being worldwide and so he was telling them you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you so this is also telling us that whenever we are called of God to go and do something for him we are not just to go out, jump into whatever it is. Of course, we first must be saved. We must be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins are washed away. We are now a child of God. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. But also because of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, is necessary in order to do the work of God that he has called you to do. Because as saying, you... Should, you um. Without that baptism, one cannot really know Jesus as one should. It's because that you shall receive power. And it's not your kind of power. It's power from the Holy Spirit. Because the person of the Holy Spirit, his job is to anoint believers. His job is to carry out the work of God and continually develop a person into the image of Christ on a daily basis. We're just instruments. Right, we're just instruments. We're just vessels being used by him. And in the book of Acts, we see basically that is the acts of the Holy Spirit through the disciples, the apostles. I'm telling you what, read the book of Acts and get ready, as Sister Sharon Cornell says. <laughs> it, it is a book filled with how the church started out with as soon as 
the day of Pentecost was was come. Whenever they were all gathered with one accord in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And you can read that in Acts chapter 2. And it says that cloven tongues as a fire came upon them. They were endued with power from on high and began to speak with other tongues. <clears throat> and it was after that that the Lord started to lead them. The Holy Spirit was given the leading and the guidance that they had needed in order as where to go and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to both Jews, Gentiles out there. And that's in the entire book of Acts. There was many miracles performed. The gospel was spread in many different parts of the earth in that area at that time. It, it, it's an incredible book filled with such power and miracles. I mean, beyond our comprehension, you know, of such magnitude. And what we will talk about is how the early church came about. And they started to establish, you know, churches in those areas. And I do believe that Brother Manuel has a lot of great material that he is able to share with us on how the early church got started and how God used mighty men and women to make all of this happen. So let's begin <clears throat> with the focus uh, uh, no one can do these things except God be with him. This was the purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Now, it is true in the Old Testament there were wonderful things that were done, miraculous, powerful things done. And it was the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit at that time could only come upon somebody. He could not fill them because Christ had not come to sanctify their lives yet, you know, through his precious blood. Right. Um, but it does say, I'll, I'll use Samson for, 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 for and, and there's others, when it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon them to do this miraculous thing, whatever the case. Okay, yes. But since Jesus give, had given his life on the cross, now we are saved, but now we are candidates to be able to be endued with this power from on high. Now, if there's people out there that are trying to do things or uh, uh, counterfeits, per se, you know, <laughs> we see a lot of imitation going on. But I'm tired of all that. We want to experience. We hear all of, I've got all of this wonderful material to share with you today. And we'll just kind of hit briefs and, and, and teach, uh, or well, not teach, but just kind of explain some of the things that were happening. Um, I want new experiences for us. Amen. It's good to look back at what God has done. But we cannot stay there. Yesterday's manna is not good for today. We must go out and gather the manna for ourselves. Okay? But I want to remind you to, to stir your heart that God has great things for you and for us. And we cannot stay in that one place sitting like a bump on a log. Well, God's going to move. God's going to move. And you never see him work in your life because you're not putting your faith into action. So with that being said, we'll open it up with this. No man can do these things except God be with him. Now, there was a group of men, and I'm reading from uh, God's Generals by Robert Levin, wonderful uh, book of history. But I want to share a portion of this. Listen, he says, on August 27th, 24 men and 24 women covenanted together to begin to pray around the clock. They agreed that one man and one woman in different places would pray in 24-hour shifts that would fill each hour of the day, every day of the week, and every week of the year. They would pray for whatever God puts in their hearts, but mostly 
They would pray for revival and the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ to every corner of the earth. It was a prayer vigil that would last for the next 100 years and would be the womb from which revival would be born. And looking through history, um, and I'm speaking of American history, I can't say much about um, other countries because I, I don't know the history of other countries. All right? But let's just take a, 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 a quick walk through uh, American, American revivals and, and, and awakenings in America. August 30th, 2015, I get, I'm assuming this, this uh, wrote, was written. Uh, in describing what happened in Jonathan Edwards, Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, 1734, observers said, it pleased God to display his free and sovereign mercy in the conversion of a great multitude of souls in a short space of time, turning them from a formal, cold, and careless profession of Christianity to live lively exercise of every Christian grace and the powerful practice of our holy religion. Okay, so that, that's this one. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But revival and awakenings are generally synonyms. The larger the geography a revival covers, the greater the tendency to call it an awakening. America has a deep, rich history of revivals and awakenings. I'm going to just mention a few. Uh, let, me, let me go back. That's about as clear a definition as we'll ever get. During a revival, God supernaturally transforms believers and non-believers in a church, local, local, region, national, or world through sudden intense enthusiasm for Christianity. Number two, uh, people sense the presence of God powerfully, conviction, despair, contrition, repentance, and prayer come easily, people thirst for God's word, many authentic conversions occur and backsliders are renewed. Okay? But this only comes about through prayer. Okay? Now, there's three things that we're going to be talking about. Miracles, persecutions, and revivals. Okay? So we're, we're starting off with the revivals part. Why? I don't know. It just went that way. <laughs> Maybe the Holy Spirit wants people to understand. Okay? You want revival in your life? Pray. The Word of God tells us that we ought to pray. Because it's when we pray, when we, be, we, we get in tune with God, and, and he, we begin to build that relationship, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, things begin to start happening. I heard uh, Carter Conlon say, when we obey, God comes in power. Heaven and earth begin to move, and the souls of men are touched by the grace of Almighty God. We had the Great Awakening of 1734 to 1743, okay? We had, uh, let, let's see here. There was uh, Reformation, Renewal, Manifestations. Uh, some, some words that I can't even pronounce. <laughs> but I want to ask, is, is America ripe for revival today? You better believe we are. But, but history tells us that National revivals and awakenings cannot be manufactured. They are sovereign, sovereign acts of mercy and grace by God himself when he supernaturally achieves in a short span what seems otherwise impossible. However, God loves to respond to the prayers of his people, 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says, If my people, which were called by my name, would humble themselves. Okay? While the decision belongs to God alone, he gives us the privilege of hastening the day through humble, repentant prayer. Okay? Uh, we have the Promise Keepers revival that happened sometime, you know, actually in 1991. Uh, Pentecostal movements. There was charismatic, charismatic movements. Uh, let's go even further back from 1947 to 1948. Uh, the post-World War, uh, World War II awakening. Uh, there was healings, revival. 1949, Billy Graham's uh, distinguished career. Uh, Christian Business Committee. College revivals. Wheat Wheaton College Revival, 1950. You know, and, and I'm just kind of hitting and highlighting. 
Okay, so I don't I don't want to be accused of oh you got it all mixed up. No, I'm just kind of highlighting and hitting some some key points of how revivals are getting started. Mm -hmm. How did they get started? There was a thirst. There was a hunger. There was prayer. People were were saying, man, I'm 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 sick and tired of the normal, and I'm ready for a revival. I'm re ready for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The urban revivals of 1875, this is going even way further back to 1885, with D.L. Moody. We all know D.L. Moody. He's, <laughs> praise God. The revivals of 1905 to 1906, the, the Welsh revival of 1904 to 1905, okay? The Azusa Street revival, that one's very popular. And every Californian should know about, about the Azusa Street revival. Why should we know? Because, man, that's a part of our Californian history. That revival broke out in Los Angeles back in 1906 when William Seymour and a group of people started praying in a home. And people were afraid to go to home churches. <laughs> man, the book of Acts says they went from house to house that's breaking of bread. Yeah, that's right. They started praying. The Holy Spirit came down. He moved, shook the foundations of the home. Miracles being being miraculously done. Why? Because people were obedient unto prayer. Obedient unto prayer. The miraculous. Now let's go back to the miracles part. You look at Peter. He They were endued on the day of Pentecost. He stood up with that Holy Ghost boldness and he began to preach. What must we do to be saved? He preached to them. Told them. You must believe. Be baptized. Seek him. He's teaching them, you know, with that Holy Ghost boldness. But it got to the point where he began to do the miraculous, things that he thought he would never do. Such, for instance, is that he would just walk down a street, not laying hands on nobody, but that his, his shadow, people were laying the sick in the streets, that if so much his shadow would just touch them, his shadow. And we know from, uh, uh, I, I wrote it down in the book of Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul, many miracles were done or many miracles, uh, mm -hmm. God wrought uh, many miracles through the apostle Paul and through the other apostles. He did many miracles through them. Mm -hmm. But this would not come without a price. There is a price that we all have to pay. We could lose loved ones. We can lose friends. We, it's a lonely road. And we can even go through persecutions. He said, he would, he said we would go through persecutions, right? That's right? He said, if I being your Lord am persecuted, they too will also per persecute you. It's not that they hate you. It's that they hate me. Now look at the Apostle Paul, what happened? They thought they were, you know, people think, oh, that they were whooping the Apostle Paul. No, they were trying to kill Jesus still that was inside of him. They knew there was something inside of him. And that scripture that says the world hated me and you too shall yeah. hate. There you go. Now, I want to share with you John Fox's Book of Martyrs. Okay. Beautiful book. How can this kind of a book be a book of romance? Because I'm going to tell you, no greater love than this than a man laid down his life for his friends. And you know what? Just as Jesus laid down his life for all of his children, for the whole world, these people that truly loved God laid down their life for him. Even unto death, Lord, I will serve you. But, Let's not get our eyes off of, you can't do this on your own. Amen. You cannot do it in the flesh. No man can do this unless God be with him. Unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit, because it is the Holy Spirit that is going to give you the strength and the power to endure hardness and persecutions. I want to just read just a, a, a few things of what some of the martyrs had to go through. 
let's well let's we were, we're talking about Peter. Let's look at at uh, at Peter. Okay, among many other saints. The blessed apostle Peter was condemned to death and crucified, as some do right, at Rome. Albeit some others, and without and not without cause, no doubt thereof, Hegesippus said that Nero sought matter against Peter to put him to death, which when the people perceived, they entreated Peter with much ado that he would fly the city or that he would leave because they were after him. Peter thought their importunity at length persuaded, prepared himself to avoid, but coming to the gate, he saw the Lord Christ come to meet him, to whom he worshipped him, saying, Lord, whither dost thou go? To whom he answered and said, I am come again to be crucified. By this, Peter perceived his sufferings to be understood, returned into the city, Jerome said, that he was crucified and being his head being uh, down and his feet upward himself so requiring because he said he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner of his Lord so this is he they told him to leave he was gonna escape he saw the Lord and then he said Lord what I don't understand what are you doing here the Lord said I'm come to be crucified in which he understood he was talking to Peter we we have to go through whatever the Lord wants us to go through Amen. he turned around went back into the city they arrested him and they hung him and he said wait I'm not worthy that I should be hung like my Lord so what they did is they turned him upside down and they hung him upside down and, 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 and there's, there's uh, many others. We look at John the Beloved, who actually died of old age, but they tried to kill him too by dumping him into a cauldron of boiling hot oil. You know, but it said that he escaped. And thus he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. No, God, no man can do these things except God be with him. These are powerful testimonies. Yes, we see how the apostles um, moved, did miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. But there's things that the Word of God doesn't share with us that possibly could have been a whole lot more. Right. You know. That's true. Now let's move through history a little bit. Okay. Let's go back to... Uh, you look at uh, John, John Wesley, for example, and I, wa I, I, I want to use John Wesley because it gives <laughs> his story of he was starting out, you know, he was didn't know what to expect, but there was a young lady that was demon possessed. He writes on October 25th, 1730, uh, 1739, I was sent for to one in Br Bristol who was taken ill that evening before. This fact, too. I will simply relate so as far as I was an ear or an eyewitness of it she lay on the ground furiously gnashing her teeth we're talking about demon possession now okay and after a while roared aloud it was not easy for three or four persons to hold her down let me tell you something when somebody is really demon possessed it ain't easy to hold them down you better you better hope you're filled with the Holy Ghost and His power and not your own strength and fleshly power because they'll knock you to the ground. Especially when the name of Jesus was named, she began to cry out and fight even harder. We prayed, he said, the violence of her symptoms ceased and, and through without a complete deliverance, but though without a complete, she wasn't completely delivered even though they prayed. In the evening being sent for to her again, I was unwilling indeed afraid to go. He, wait a minute, you tell me that a man of God was afraid to go? Oh yes, listen to this. Thinking it would not avail unless someone who were strong in faith were to wrestle with God for her. Wrestle with God. Hmm, I heard David Brainerd once say, it is good. Now I didn't hear him, but I read his quote, apologize for that. 
He said it's good to wrestle for divine blessings. Are you willing to pray for somebody all night long? Are you willing to get on your knees? Are you willing to be in fastings, to get in tune with God? Fasting doesn't make you a super Christian. Just You're just you know being real with God, saying, Lord, I want to be empty because I need you to fill me. You know, I opened my testament on those words. I was afraid, and I went and hid my talent in the earth. Wow. Talk about a rebuke. He said, I stood reproved and I immediately went. She began screaming before I came in the room, then broke out into a horrid laughter mixed with blasphemy and grievous words to hear. One who, from many circumstances, apprehended a prenatural agent to, to be concerned in this, asking, how, did thou, how didst thou dare enter into a Christian? Was answered, she's not a Christian, she's mine. This is demon spirit speaking now to him. Mm -hmm. Dost thou not tremble in the name of Jesus or at the name of Jesus? No words followed, but she shrunk back and trembled exceedingly. Art thou not increasing in thy own damnation? It was faintly, it was faintly answered, I, I. She was backed into a corner. You see, demon spirits are backed into a corner when you begin to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ which was followed by fresh cursing and blasphemy. My brother coming in, she cried out, Preacher! Phil Preacher! I don't love Phil Preaching. I hate it. This was repeated two hours together, with spitting and all the expressions of strong aversion. We left her at 12, but called again about noon Friday on the 26th. And now it was that God showed he heareth the prayer. This is God's love and mercy. All her pangs had stopped in a moment. She was filled with peace and knew that the son of wickedness was departed from her. Hallelujah. Amen. No man can do these things except God be with him. Wesley was afraid. Doesn't matter. God was with him. This is the importance for us to understand we need... It's important for us to understand that we need to be filled and in tune with the Holy Ghost. That's right. How do you know you're filled with the Holy Ghost? How do you know you're filled with the Holy Ghost? The evidence. Yes. Mm -hmm. The evidence. And there's more than one evidence, but the initial evidence is speaking in that heavenly language as the spirit gives the utterance they spoke with another tongue yes nobody could understand it some were even saying hey how is it that they speak in our language heavenly language okay so endued with power this is the importance of us being endued with power I want to share another story with you. This is humbleness, okay? Looking at Catherine Coleman. Listen to what she says. People are asking, why am I so ill? If God loves me, why did he take my child? I have cancer and I'm afraid to die. What can I do? My husband is mentally depressed. My home, our marriage is just miserable. I have prayed for my healing and I believe that God can heal. Why am I not healed? How would you answer them? You're a Christian. How are you going to answer them? Aren't you supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost? She writes, how would you answer them? How can I answer them? I would give my life. Life if that would be the answer. In the great miracle services in Los Angeles, in Pittsburgh, no matter in which uh, city, there are thousands of people who come expecting me to work that miracle that they are seeking. But I have nothing whatsoever to do with what happens. It is within God's power, thus the importance for us to be in tune with the Holy Ghost, so that the Lord can lead us where we should go to say what we're supposed to say and to do that which we are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. 
She says, I am just as amazed and thrilled as anyone else when the service begins and God works his wonders in the midst of all. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes in power and he uses the vessel yielded unto him. There's the key right there. Who is yielding? Who is yielding? No man can do these things except God be with him. And let me tell you, the Holy Ghost that has the power, he is God. I cannot use the Holy Spirit. He must use me. I like that. It is not so important that I touch anyone, but rather that the Holy Spirit touch the life, the heart, and fill the individual with himself. Catherine Coleman. And there's many others. John G. Lake. There's uh, D.L. Moody. We just mentioned Wesley. There's many others that, that had some wonderful movings of the Holy Spirit. Yes, and, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth. I'll never forget that story. <laughs> when his friend called him and said, my wife is dying, brother. you got to come. you got to pray for her. I just want to... I bet you Smith Wigglesworth is on the other end of the line. He's thinking... What's going on here? I thought he was a man of prayer. <laughs> Come on. He, you know, obviously, I'm not going to go lay hands on him, too. No, he said, I'll be right there. He walks into the house, goes into the room, and he sees his friend sitting in the corner over there crying. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. What do I do? She's gone. Smith Wigglesworth looks at the bed, and there's his friend's wife laying with her hands on her you know, crossed on her, on her stomach, on her, you know, chest, whatever. And here comes the man of God. Uh-uh, this ain't happening, not on my watch. He walks, pulls back the covers, picks her up by her shoulders, spins her up against the wall, looks at her straight in the eyes and says, Death, I rebuke thee in the name of Jesus. Her body starts convulsing. He plants her feet on the ground and she comes back to life. Raise the dead. No man can do these things except God be with him. We can look at all of these past things, all of these past history events, from the book of Acts to the 19, uh, 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 or the 1600s, uh, to, to the, 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 the 70s, even the 50s. Miraculous healing, look at A.A. A. Allen, Brother Shambach, many, many more. John G. Lake was back, back in the... 18, 1900s. Maria Woodworth Eder. John G. Lake was called to be a, a part of the missionary work there in Africa. Didn't know how to go. Didn't know how to go about it. But the Lord said, "This is what I want you to do. Pack your pack your family up and go." Now I'm just kind of paraphrasing what was going on. But you know what happened? He's well, I don't got a dime to my name. How am I going to go? Faith in action. He just packed his bags, like he said got in the car, they drove to the airport or to the, 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 the I don't even think they had airports back then. No, they didn't. <laughs> I apologize. I'm looking for that word, boat, a ship, the ship. They got in, they were gonna, they were gonna sail over there. That, that sounds correct. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up, I promise. But I'll tell you, he went, they didn't know how they were gonna get there. But sure enough, sure enough, a little old lady came and said, the Lord told me to put this into your hand. Or a brother did. It was $150, I think, for them to get over there. They arrived in Africa. Okay, Lord, now what are we going to do? I don't have no place to stay. We can't stay here, you know, on the docks. And then all of a sudden, a little old lady says, you, you Brother Lake? Uh, yes, ma'am. You're to come with me. Okay. They had a nice little college all prepared for him. That's beautiful. We're talking about all of the miraculous things that are being done. Now, some will tell you, well, God doesn't move like that no more. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> yes, he does. Because God don't change. Amen. He's the same yesterday as he is today, and he'll continue to be the same forevermore. Yes. Hallelujah. Okay? Now, 
Is the early church better than us today? No. So we will probably experience, well, not probably, I'm, I don't want no doubt, but he's going to move. He is moving like that today. Amen. Okay. But are we better than the early church that we would not suffer the persecutions and have to go through some hardships? Not. No. The scripture says all that live godly in Christ Jesus will endu uh, undergo persecution. God is no respecter of persons. He may give a little bit more talents to one than the other, but we're all going to be judged according to the measure that was given unto us. You know, we're currently writing a, a, a you know, we're, we're working on this book, uh, uh, By My Spirit, uh, a uh, compilation of testimonies from different parts of the world. Uh, I'll tell you, man, just typing this book, you guys are going to be amazed. And, and I hope that, you know, many will be blessed by this book. Um, not sure what we're going to do with it yet. I... We, 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 we're, as soon as it comes out, we're just going to start sending it out to people, you know, and uh, I pray that my goal is that people would be blessed. Uh, you want a great awakening in your life. What are you willing to do for it? Yes, definitely. You want anointing. What are you willing to do for it? I heard Raven Hill said, you can't even handle the anointing you have now. You don't even use it. You don't do with it. You, you put it in the closet is what you did. You put it on a bookshelf. Now, people don't like to hear things like this, but it's the truth. I'm sick and tired of religion. I'm sick and tired of just the same old Sunday service. Amen. I want the moving and operation of the Holy Ghost moving and working in our lives. And you know what? I'm going to do everything I can to see that my children and myself are able to have that experience. Amen. And we can have it. Yes, we, yes, we can. Through Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. It is a promise of the Father yes, right. to be endued with power from on high. Be endued with power from on high. Hmm. Think about that for a minute. Power from on high? Endued means to be with overflowing. David said it in the book of Psalms, my cup runneth over. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Talking about a mighty young man that walked down into the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't fear. He had all his confidence in, 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 in God. God was with him. He had confidence. He walked down and what did he do? That giant looked at him and laughed. He said, you come to me. He says, am I a dog? You come to me with sticks and staves. He says, man, I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. David said, oh, no, you come to me with the spear and the sword. How embarrassing. That must have been for the Philistines. Mm -hmm. He said, but I come to you, hallelujah, in the name of the Lord of hosts. <laughs> it's time for you Davids out there to begin to get your confidence back. And come back to Christ, get refilled with the Holy Ghost, and be endued with power from on high, and do the work that God has called you to do. Stop being lazy, stop sitting like a bump on a log, and take action. Yes. And heed the call of God in your life, and He will move. When we obey, God comes in power, heaven and earth begin to move, and the souls of men are touched by the grace of Almighty God. Right, we we've got to start putting our faith into action because even the scripture says, "Without faith, it's impossible to please God." If you want to see a mighty move of God in your life, you know there's there's a cost to that. Doing the will of God, there's a cost to that. There's some things that you're gonna to have to lay aside, and the biggest thing that you're gonna to have to lay aside is self will. 
Because when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. <laughs> he didn't want to go through that. But in that prayer that he had prayed to his Father, he said, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Amen. We've got to start seeking God for his will to be done in our lives. If you want to know what your calling is, what God has called you to do, you've got to start putting aside those distractions and hindrances and you know whatever it is that is taking up your time to spend with the Lord you got to lay aside those things you know for a period of time at some times like you know what are you giving your time to there's things in our lives that can become idols it could be anything in our lives whether it's money whether it's people whether it's video games social media etc are you willing to lay aside those things that you love for the cause of Christ? Are you willing to go all the way for Him? And it's got to be not just a partial surrender, but he, it's got to be a 100% surrender. You've got to give Him everything. Amen. Lay it all down His feet. He's a jealous God. He's jealous for His people he, with godly jealousy. He said... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. He said to have no other gods before him. He wants you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to talk with you. But whatever that calling is, seek him for it. And lay those things aside and lay aside your self-will. Because you cannot grow unless you come to the Garden of Gethsemane. Where you say, nevertheless, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. We, we got to stop limiting the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives. Amen. We got to stop putting God in a box. Let him tie your hands that he can start moving and working in your life. So when people saying, I'm here, Lord, I'm here. Okay, what, what's, what's next? What's next? But they're still doing the things that they want to do. They're not laying aside things in their lives. And they're not seeking God. They're saying, I'm just sit, standing here and I'm just waiting for God to move. Yet you want God to rend the heavens, but he's waiting for you to rend your heart. Amen. That has to come first. A broken Be and empty. a contrite heart you yes. will not despise. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, that, you know, we need to, to obey. When we start obeying, God will use us and he gives us the strength to be able to endure hardness suffer persecutions to do things and it's not that we're doing them it's that we're just being obedient we're we're, we're laying hands on people we're praying we're casting out demons you know in the name of jesus christ like he commanded us you know uh, we're preaching the gospel and proclaiming the gospel as he you know commissioned us um, but I'll never forget, even for persecutions, and reading from John uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, Nicomachus uh, was arrested for being a, a Christian. And uh, in those days, they openly persecuted people. They put them to the rack. They tortured people and, you know, to renounce their faith. And... The pain for Nicomachus was so excruciating. They had him on the rack, and in those days it was public. Everybody could come and watch. And I don't know why people would want to watch somebody else be persecuted like that. Mm. But Nicomachus was already near death. He was already going to be going here in the next few minutes. Okay. And they were trying to get him to recant. And Finally, the pain was just more than he could bear. And there was a young damsel out in the crowd. She was a Christian also. And he finally gave up and recanted so that he can have a few moments ease of pain. She cries out from the audience, why would you do that? For a few moments ease of pain, you're gonna die anyways. They arrested her and asked her, are you a Christian? She said, yes, with power and confidence and boldness. 
that they took her outside of the city and beheaded her. Nicomach has died. But I want to ask a question. Because he recanted under that type of pressure, do you think he went to hell? What do you think? It's a good possibility because the scripture says, if you're ashamed of me, I would be ashamed of you before my father. Not but under that type of pressure. We're still flesh. We're still flesh. The Bible says God's mercy surpasses our understanding. I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of love, thoughts of mercy, and he understands that type of pressures. We're not Jesus. Jesus was the only one to be able in all the world and all through history to be able to suffer that type of persecution. But to have your skin peeled back while you're still alive, tied down, to have parts of your body mutilated? No. I believe that he made it. At the last moments, it was just more that he could bear. And we serve a God that knows. He understands. I was going to say, it would be between the Lord and that person, you know, because we, we can't judge that. You know, so I, I just, uh, I look at that story and I see you're not going to be able to endure those things without the power of the Holy Spirit. You will not be able to go through it. I've seen Christians punched, beat up, all kinds of things, families taken away, and they still stand. You know why? Because they're standing on the promises of God. Okay. Who was it that was burned at a stake? And in the midst of that, he prayed and cried out to God and said, Lord, give me something to withstand this. And it was right after that, that the Lord baptized him in the Holy Spirit and he started to speak in other tongues. And it was throughout that time, it's almost as if that when you shall receive power from on high, it's almost as if he was, he was so full of joy and filled with that power that he, as if he could not even know that the pain was there. Oh, gladly. And many of, the, many of the Christians that were being persecuted in that magnitude were gladly, willingly going to lay down their life for the Lord. Right. And, and we see in our modern day movies, you know, the Apostle Paul, uh, when Luke is in prison with a lot of Christians, he's telling the children and the families, look, the pain will only be for a little while, but just, just hang in there, just pray, because it will all be over and we'll be with the Lord forever. Just hang in there. And let me tell you, there's, there's a lot of people here in the United States. You think you're going through something now? You think you're suffering persecutions? Well, I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. Because we fellowship with brothers and sisters, and these guys know. And they're being persecuted for their faith. Threatened in the middle of the night. I've heard uh, stories already that uh, pastors... Uh, ten pastors within the past months have been uh, had their throat slit because they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in India, and and it's it's a shame, but they were willing to do it for the cause of Christ. Amen. Absolutely. Well, as we close out tonight, are there any last? Uh, questions or comments, concerns? Uh, David, I'll, I'll, I'll let you. I've said enough. <laughs> uh, well, just real quick to go, I want to go back to the, the miracles. A lot of people nowadays, um, when they go to church, they go to expecting something. Mm -hmm. And we should all be like that. We should all go to church expecting something from Absolutely. God. But in the manner of, oh, I'm not going to believe unless God shows me something or I see a miracle right in front of my eyes or God speaks to me in an audible voice. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not seeking God's face truly with a whole heart, if you're not giving God his time, 
and you're just completely ignoring him, it ain't going to happen. Amen. <laughs> it's just like Brother Tyler said, You there's going to come a cost. It may cost you your time. It may cost you your sleep. It may cost you something yes. to have that special experience. And to be honest, those miracles, when we hear about, when we read or hear about, you know, the blind being, you know, the blind receiving their sight, the lepers being healed, those are great miracles. I'm not downplaying any of those. But the greatest miracle a person could ever receive is that of salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, having their soul set free from the bondage of sin and no longer yes. being in the hands of Satan. Yes. A new creation in Christ Jesus. A new person having their name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. That when, they, when their time here on earth is up, their greatest gift that they will ever receive is to walk right next to Jesus, the one who saved them. Amen. To walk, to walk in the streets of gold, to have their very own mansion, and to be in glory for eternity, forever. There's no no time limit forever. That's how it is. So, well said. Praise well God said. for that. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I pray that these podcasts are a blessing to you. And I pray that you've definitely gotten something out of everything that we said tonight. Hopefully it's, um, you know, it is. there's definitely a lot to expound on. But I pray if it's been a blessing to you, please share it with others. And if you do enjoy these podcasts and devotions, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click that notification bell so that you will be notified every time that a new video is uploaded. So we thank you so much. Thank you for all your support and prayers and God bless you. See